Chris. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to adding DNA to your genealogical toolkit. This is where everybody wants to be. Morris Gleason is our speaker. He is a psychiatrist and a pharmaceutical physician, as well as a genetic genealogist. He is administrator of several surnamed DNA projects, works with adoptees, and has appeared on TV as a DNA consultant. He authors several blogs, is a regular contributor to genealogical magazines, and his YouTube videos are very popular. He has organized the DNA lectures for Genetic Genealogy Ireland in Dublin and Who Do You Think You Are in the UK since 2002, as well as given talks all over Ireland, the UK, and internationally. He was voted Genetic Genealogist of the Year in 2015 from the surname DNA Journal and Superstar Genealogist Ireland in 2016 from Canada's Anglo-Celtic Connections. Please welcome Morris Gleason. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, thank you very much also to Celtic Connections for inviting me to speak. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Boston, where I was in 1983 as a medical student working for Joe Kennedy. <laughs> Not the Joe Kennedy, a Joe Kennedy. <laughs> Kennedy Studios, downtown crossing. I had a wooden cart that I would wheel from Charles Street down to uh, either Copley Square, Downtown Crossing, Boston Common, or Park Street, and I would sell Boston hats and t-shirts <laughs> for the summer in order to get the money to raise, uh, raise the money for the, the college fees uh, the following uh, fall in Ireland. So I had a great time in Boston, and it's been uh, great to be here for the last couple of days, retracing some of my steps and trying to remember exactly what I did and where I lived. So um, uh, it's great to be here. And today I'm going to talk to you about adding DNA to your genealogical toolkit. How many people in the audience have actually done a DNA test? Right, so that's the majority of people. So uh, this is going to be an interactive uh, session. And I'm going to run through the different types of DNA, the three main types, and what they can do for you. But do feel free to ask questions as we go through. And of course, I'll be available afterwards, because we're not having lunch until 11.45, so we can have a nice long chat after the uh, session today as well. I'm also recording the session just for you guys. So we're going to try and put it up on the uh, website, the Celtic Connections website afterwards, so that uh, that will uh, mean that you don't need to take copious notes, because you will be able to watch this again and again and again, <laughs> should you so choose. Um, I also have a blog spot and a YouTube channel called DNA and Family Tree Research. You'll find lots of useful information there about DNA and about um, and there are lots of useful videos there as well. So to, to start off with then, uh, DNA comes with a government health warning. Uh, because when I first started this back in, oh, about 2008 or so, um, I had got into genealogy because my mom had passed away in 2005, my dad was alone in the family home back in Dublin, and I thought, I need an excuse to phone him from London three times a week and ask him, are you okay, how are you doing? Without making it sound like I was asking him, how are you doing, are you okay? So he'd been doing the family tree on and off for 30 years, and I thought, well, why don't I suggest we do it together and I can join him on this family tree research? And so that's how I got involved in genealogy, and uh, we made lots of wonderful discoveries. Uh, we reconnected with a second cousin he hadn't seen in 60 years, and she gave him nine, uh, 20 letters that his mother had written in 1920. And she'd kept them in the attic for the last 30 years. We also traveled to Los Angeles to meet second cousins he'd never met before. So it really opened up his social outlets. Um, and then we came across DNA, and I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. I must buy myself a DNA kit. And then I thought, actually, I'll give it to my dad for Christmas, because I'm terrible with Christmas presents. And this is a great Christmas present to give someone. Uh, of course, whatever results he has are going to apply to me. And then I thought, actually, how do I know he's my father? <laughs> No, seriously, because I could have been secretly adopted. How would you know if you were secretly adopted? You wouldn't know because it's a secret. So I thought, oh, wow, okay, well, this, this could be a bit dodgy. So I said, happy Christmas, Dad. And um, <laughs> hoped for the best, best. 
So uh, it, it does come with that government health warning that you really don't know what you will find. And some people find they have half-siblings that they never knew existed. Some people find out that they were switched at the hospital, like some poor Canadian guy not too long ago. And some people find that uh, they are adopted themselves. So it does come with a government health warning. Um, it's not so bad if you're doing it for yourself, but if you're doing it for other family members, it is important that they know that uh, you know there could be some surprises. And how would you feel, Great Aunt Mabel, if you found uh, if there was a surprise in your DNA results? So it's very important to keep Great Aunt Mabel happy. Um, it can give you those unexpected answers. It's not for those of a nervous disposition. Now. There are a variety of different companies that do the DNA uh, tests. There's uh, Family Tree DNA, Ancestry, 23andMe. They all have a variety of different costs which have come down uh, hugely over the course of the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, some of the companies have gone by the west wayside, such as Ireland's, Britain's, and Scotland's DNA, but new companies have come out like Living DNA and My Heritage DNA. Uh, currently, the um, number of people doing DNA testing is increasing exponentially. There are approximately 18 million people in these various companies' DNA databases. Ancestry has 10 million people in its database. 23andMe has 5 million people in its database. Uh, My Heritage is up to about 2 million now, uh, Family Tree DNA about 1.5 million, and uh, Living DNA is still getting off the ground. It's a, the, real, the youngest of these companies, and it has tens of thousands at this point in time. They will be introducing matching, DNA matching between cousins in the next uh, month or two. So keep an eye out for that because they are introducing some very interesting software that none of the other companies have. Which company was it? Living DNA. So it's the new kid on the block. We'll talk a little bit about it during the presentation, uh, but the situation is currently evolving rapidly. And if you want to join the DNA databases, the most cost-effective way is to test with Ancestry and then transfer your data for free to all the other databases. My Heritage, Living DNA, GEDmatch, 23andMe do not accept transfers from other companies. So you would have to test with 23andMe if you wanted access to their 5 million strong database. But be aware, of course, that 23andMe is largely focused on medical risk assessment. So 80% of the people there are not interested in genealogy. They just want to find out what is the risk for Parkinson's disease or the risk for Alzheimer's disease. So frequently I find that if I contact these people and say, hey, we're a match, let's figure out how we're connected, you never hear anything from them. So 23andMe is kind of the, the odd man out in this group as far as genealogical research is concerned. So what can you get from a DNA test? Well, first and foremost, a community of avid genetic genealogists. How many people think I look like a normal person? <laughs> Well, far, far more than I anticipated. Uh, thank you, madam. So, um, I am I am obsessed with genetic genealogy, and I will be one of those people that stays up till four o'clock in the morning saying, "Oh, just one more ancestral line." Uh, so, uh, it is something that you can get very, very heavily involved with, which will give you hours of happiness but it'll rob your spouse and family of the hours of happiness they wish that they could have spent with you. So it is a, a wonderful uh, hobby to get involved in. Um, it also will allow you to see where your deep ancestry came from and the human migration pathway that your ancestors took out of Africa 250,000 years ago up to the present day. It connects you with long-lost cousins. It gives you your ethnic makeup. We'll talk a little bit about that. It tells you what percent Neanderthal you are. If you don't know already, it's about 3%. You know, it, it makes for interesting coffee table talk. And, and people always like saying, well, my Neanderthal is bigger than yours. <laughs> so um, it's, it's not of any major genealogical relevance, but it's a fun thing to talk about at cocktail parties. And then, of course, medical risk assessment we've mentioned as well. Um, the ISOG wiki is a very, very useful source of information. 
So I would encourage you all to check out the ISOG wiki. ISOG, of course, is the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, completely free to join, um, set up by Catherine Borges. And now this wiki uh, uh, website has lots of useful information on different aspects of DNA. Also very important is the ISOG Facebook group, but also the variety of other DNA Facebook groups that offer free advice to anybody that joins and posts a question. Now, I'm very stoical about Facebook. Um, I think it's a great way of keeping in touch with people you don't want to speak to. <laughs> um, but. My, my dad's Facebook account was cloned and he was hacked and uh, you know emails went out to all his address list. I have been mugged in London, please send money. Um, to which most people said, but your son lives there, what's he done to you? Um, <laughs> so you do have to be very careful about Facebook. I never put in your real date of, of birth. Um, you can use a false name if you want to. Uh, I find it really good for genealogy and for asking questions and for publicizing things like my latest blog post or latest video. It's been great for advertising the, the DNA lectures in Dublin and in Belfast that we have every year, as well as the Who Do You Think You Are events that used to be in Birmingham, but which are now being replaced by other events next year. So we've got two uh, genealogy conferences in the UK next year. Uh, one in June and one in September, one in Birmingham, one in London. So it's a very good way of publicizing those and encouraging people to get involved. But if you post a query on a lot of these Facebook groups, you will get an answer to your question within five or 10 minutes. So it's a great resource. Uh, and I'd encourage you to join Facebook just for that reason. Doing a DNA test, very, very easy. You swab your cheek or you give a sample of saliva. That goes off in a test tube to the lab. And then in the lab, they look at your sample. Oh, blue, it must be royal blood. And they put that through the machine, and it comes out the other end, and they post your results on your own personalized web page protected by your username and password. Now, your own results in isolation do not tell you a huge amount. It's just a string of numbers or a string of letters, and you cannot really tell what that says about you. But it's when you compare your DNA results to the millions of people in the database, that's when you get a list of your matches. And these will be genetic cousins with whom you share a common ancestor at some stage in the relatively recent past, if you're using autosomal DNA, and we'll talk about that. It has a reach of about 300 years or so. Um, if you're using Y DNA, it'll take you back to the origin of your surname. So it gets beyond that 1700 mark. So this is the real value of doing a DNA test. It's the ability to compare your DNA with the DNA results of millions of other people. Uh, one of the companies, Family Tree DNA, has a facility where it allows you to become a citizen scientist and run your own DNA project. And I run a variety of different surname projects, the Gleason Project, the Farrell, Spiran, Malloy, O'Malley, Maloney. There's a few of them. Um, and we have made some wonderful discoveries in these surname projects and connected people to their Irish roots in particular uh, in a way that a lot of them would never have thought possible. And we look at a few of those. So that's Family Tree DNA, and it's allowing us uh, ordinary citizens the opportunity to start our own DNA projects. How many people have a DNA project on Family Tree DNA? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, great. Um, let's take a closer look at that little DNA sample you put into the test tube, because when you swabbed, you dislodged maybe 100 cheek cells into that test tube. And each of these cheek cells has a, a cell membrane surrounding all the internal organelles. These blue ones here are called the mitochondria, and they contain mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and then in the nucleus of the cell, we have all the chromosomes. And in humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. That's 46 altogether. And they're arranged in pairs. So we have one, uh, uh, two copies of chromosome one. Uh, one copy comes from your mother. The other comes from your father. We have two copies of chromosome two. 
One is paternal, one is maternal, and so on, all the way, the way up to pair number 23. And these are sometimes called the sex chromosomes because they determine your gender, whether you're going to be male or female. And there's two types of sex chromosome. There's the X chromosome and there's the Y chromosome. If you get two X chromosomes, you're a woman. If you get an X and a Y chromosome, you're a disappointment. So, <laughs> Not really, not really. Um, and uh, from this arises the three different types of Y DNA test. The Y chromosome, which is only passed on from father to son, travels back along the father, father, father line, the direct male line. And it also is very, very useful for uh, researching surnames because they pass along the direct male line. They're passed from father to son, just like the Y chromosome is. Question here. Except when they don't. Except when they don't. And there are a couple of instances where they don't. And that would be where, uh, for example, you're living in Iceland, where it doesn't have an inherited surname system. It's a patronymic system. So Eric is Johnson, son of John. John is Williamson, son of William. William is son of Patrickson, and so on. But well, you were thinking of Thailand also has that type of system. You were thinking of another example? Well, exactly. I'm thinking predominantly Irish, and my father and my brother both have spent many of their married lives in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And so they have a different name. Many of the matches don't have the same name on the Y DNA, and there's a variety of reasons for that, and I'll cover it actually in one of the subsequent slides, but it's a very, very good point because. Um, there is an Irish expression that somebody was born on the other side of the blanket. Um, so, uh, and that happens very, very frequently. So that the chances that your surname that you carry today goes all the way back across the mists of time a thousand years ago to the guy who originated that surname is about 50-50. Because things happen along the way and there's a surname or a DNA switch. Uh, a young widow uh, she remarries, and her three children, one-year-old, two-year-old, and three-year-old, take the name of the new husband. So there's been a surname switch. They'll have the DNA of the old husband, but the surname of the new husband. And there's illegitimacy, and there's adoption, and there is, you won't marry my daughter unless you change your name to Fitzsimons. <laughs> or you won't inherit my property unless you change your name to Sidebottom. Seriously, grandfather, side bottom? No. Um, so there's a variety of reasons for why there can be these surname or DNA switches. So it means that you might be genetically a Kelly, but genealogically a Ryan. Um, the second type of DNA uh, is mitochondrial DNA. And mothers pass this mitochondrial DNA from uh, onto their daughters and their sons. So it's passed on to all the children but only the daughters pass it on to their children, and only those daughters pass it on to their children. So this goes back along the direct female line. It is the least useful of all of these three main tests. And we'll talk a little bit about it later on. The third type of test is the most useful. It is the autosomal DNA. Autosomal really is all of the 46 chromosomes apart from the last two. So it doesn't include the X and the Y chromosome. So it's the first 44 of your 46 chromosomes. To confuse things, when you do the autosomal DNA test, they throw the X chromosome in for free. So if you're a woman, you're getting the 44 autosomes plus the two X chromosomes, which is all 46 of the 46 chromosomes that humans have. If you're a man doing an autosomal DNA test, you get 45 out of the 46 because you only have one X because your other sex chromosome is the Y chromosome you got from your father. Okay? So this is the most useful of the, of the, of the three tests, but it has a much more limited reach. The Y DNA can take you back more than 200,000 years into Africa when we were all running around Africa there. The same with mitochondrial DNA, it takes us back virtually to the beginning of anatomically modern humans, but the autosomal DNA only has a reach of about 300 years, which is good if you're doing Irish research because the records run out around about 1800. <laughs> so the autosomal DNA can actually be a very, very good way of shortcutting your documentary research. And I would always say that DNA is great in combination with documentary research. It's not a substitute for documentary research. I don't think there's any time that you should have to wait 
until you've done DNA, to do DNA, you know, I, I'm going to do my tree and then I'll do the DNA. I think just do them in parallel. Do them both together. Because it will shortcut a lot of um, uh, the work that you might be doing on your documentary research. Uh, of course, it's great that you can develop your tree as far as possible using the paper records because that, that maximizes the impact that the DNA results will have on your particular research. So, why DNA and mitochondrial DNA are very good for deep as well as recent ancestry, but autosomal DNA is only good for recent ancestry. Very important, why DNA only looks at one ancestral line? Mitochondrial DNA only looks at one ancestral line. Autosomal DNA will take you back to about the level of your 64 great, 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 great grandparents. So it looks at 64 ancestral lines. That's why it's so useful from a genealogical point of view. But let's take a look at why DNA to start off with, and that is going to give us deep ancestry, surname projects, and same surname cousins. And here's a map of the Y chromosome. Uh, you can see that along its length, there's a variety of different genes. If we look at these genes, they have things like the inability to see or hear the obvious, uh, obviously a male trait. <coughs> Uh, the ability to remember and to tell jokes. Uh, one of my favorites, refusal to ask for directions. <laughs> so these are the genes that code for your typical male characteristics. And also dotted along your average chromosome are going to be DNA markers that are useful for ancestral purposes. So if you imagine that all along this chromosome, there will be points where the uh, DNA markers are ancestrally informative. They mutate at such a frequent rate that they're very, very good for distinguishing who is related to who. And if we break down the Y chromosome and unravel the, the DNA, we see the, the double helix structure that you find uh, uh, that was discovered by Watson and Crick back in 1953. And uh, then you have this, this uh, line of letters, uh, and it's made up of uh, nucleotide bases G, C, A, and T, guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine. And G always binds with C and A always binds with T, so the curvy letters bind with each other, the straight-edged letters bind with each other, and that's what gives you the genetic code. So frequently, you will see genetic code just written as a string of letters. That's where it comes from. And what we're doing is we're comparing your string of letters with somebody else's string of letters. Arising out of these letters, there's two types of DNA marker, not just Y DNA marker, but DNA marker in general. The first is called a short tandem repeat, or STR, and you can see here that the sequence TAC, 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 TAC is repeated three times, so the value for this marker would be three. So if you look at your Y-DNA results, you'll just see it's as a string of numbers, and that's why, because it's actually telling you how many times a particular motif of letters is repeated. The second type of marker is called a SNP, or a single nucleotide polymorphism, and it's just a substitution. This letter here, A, in the, in the previous generation, it might have been a G, but for some reason there's been a mutation and that G has been replaced by an A. So over the course of many thousands of years, these minor mutations begin to accumulate and that allows us to trace the origin of the Y chromosome back in time. It's like nature is leaving us little, a little paper trail that we can use to study human migration and uh, the ancestral path of our uh, ancestors out of Africa. Uh, in an, the, the most important thing though, of course, is comparing your string of numbers with somebody else's string of numbers to see if you're a close match. So in this particular one, here is my matches at 67 markers. I match somebody called Little, Gleason, McLaughlin, Gleason, 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 McLaughlin. So again, not everybody has the same surname, like you were saying, um, but the majority of people are Gleasons. So these are people that I'm going to be related to at some time in the past, but I don't know if it's 200 years ago or 800 years ago at this point in time. There's also a column that tells you the genetic distance, which is really how many steps away from an exact match you are from each of your list of people. Um, the further away, obviously, the more distant the relationship. So if I have an exact match and the genetic distance is zero, it means I'm very closely related to that person. 
If I have a match that goes down to seven out of 67 markers, that genetic distance of seven, seven steps away from an exact match, tells me that this person is probably related fairly distantly, maybe 300, 400, 500 years ago. And the most important thing if you are doing a Y-DNA test is to put in the birth location of your most distant known ancestor on your father, father, father line. And that's why I highlight it here, because this really gives us a clue to the ancestral origins of your particular surname. And is um, Sure. If, if, for example, in, in my case, I'm certain of an ancestor four generations back, but I'm pretty certain of an ancestor that's seven generations back, would it, would it be better for me to put in the four generations back one or the seven generations? I would prefer to put in the, the seven generations one. Um, uh, and indicate that it's possible. And the way that I do that is I put a question mark before the person or a question mark before the, I'm not really sure about this is the right location for his birth, but I'm pretty sure. You know, and it just tells people, you know, don't take this as gospel. I think it's query Thomas Gleason, and I think it's query Boher Lahan Tipperary, because that's where he was married, and that's where all the children lived subsequently. I'm fairly positive it was. Um, and the reason for that is, is uh, because we want to try and get back as far as possible. Now, uh, Family Tree DNA have introduced two new pages on their projects where hopefully we can convert them into a pedigree uh, page where you can post your pedigree. And they used to have this on World Families Net, uh, but we've lost them unfortunately because of GDPR. And now the Patriarchs page on worldfamilies.net is no longer available for a lot of the projects. But really, the pedigree is a very, very important part, and that encourages people to collaborate uh, when, when they match them, match each other. Um, there's over 9,400 projects uh, up on um, Family Tree DNA, and this is old data, in fact, has now gone up to over 10,000. And uh, the number of record matches is close to six, more clo closer to 700,000 now. So uh, the database is constantly expanding. And just to give you an example of what a project looks like and what you can glean from it, uh, I, I, this is a very busy slide, but I only show it so that you can appreciate the pretty colors. <laughs> and the pretty colors are very, very important because if you look, you can, you can see there's a pattern. There's a pattern in this first group here with some of the columns extending right down across the group. And just to orientate you, here we have a list of the people in the group. Here we have their most distant known ancestor. And then we have the, the DNA markers along their Y chromosome. Imagine the Y chromosomes have been stacked on top of each other. And all the markers are aligned. We're seeing here that in this marker that, that most people have a value, I think it's 17. In this one, it's mainly 18, 19, 18. In this one, it's 24, and so on. So a pattern is beginning to emerge for this group. And this is the genetic pattern of this particular group. Very different from the genetic pattern of the group below it. And it means that anybody who matches group one, you know, we can put them into that particular group because they have the same genetic pattern. Uh, there's also a group three, and again, that has a very different colored pattern, a very different genetic pattern to the other two groups. But because we also know their birth location, we can say, that anybody who matches group two is 99% likely to have ancestors who came from North Tipperary. Anyone who matches group three is 99% probable to have Gleason ancestors from West Clare. And anyone who matches group one go back to Cockfield, Suffolk in England, but not only that, they go back to a named individual born in 1609. And so it's almost as if your genealogy is being handed to you on a platter. And this particular group in, in uh, group lineage one, they're a, a new uh, US colonial group from uh, New England. So Thomas Gleason came over to New England very, very early on. And of course, he had lots of descendants who had lots of descendants. And a lot of people in New England, among them Jackie Gleason, who thought he was Irish and used to hang around all those Irish bars in the Bronx and, you know, hang out with all those Irish dudes, he discovered he was English. <laughs> and that genealogy was never released. 
<laughs> so, uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful way of um, isolating a, a place of interest for your own documentary research. Because if you knew you were Gleason's but they came from Ireland, and then you do this test and you suddenly match people in West Clare, well, that's the place to start looking in the records. And it helps narrow down and focus your own paper-based research. Now, there's another group there, and uh, they are probably uh, an NPE, non-paternity event, one of these surname or DNA switches we talked about previously. And they're based in the US. There's no link back to the old country at this point in time. Uh, sure. Sure. The, the, the tree of mankind um, started off in Africa 250,000 years ago. We had haplogroup A, and then we got haplogroup B a couple of tens of thousands of years later, and then E1B1A is very common in, in Africa to this day. And then about 50,000 years ago, um, there was a bunch of Africans that came out uh, uh, and went across Arabia, and they populated the rest of the world, and that's where we are today. In actual fact, how many people are haplogroup R1B? Quite a few, quite a few. Um, uh, the, the, the naming of these, these groups is just that the people that went off to China developed a slightly different colored pattern, slightly different genetic signature to the people that went off to Western Europe, to the people that went off to India. Um, we all had dark skin up to about 6,000 years ago. So present day non-Africans, even the ones that came into Europe, our skin was actually dark up to about 6,000 years ago. And then um, there was an evolutionary selection process because we were lacking in uh, vitamin D and uh, lighter skin absorbed more sunlight and blah, 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 blah. So Cheddar Man that they uh, reported on relatively recently, he was dark skinned and he had the green eyes as well. So uh, it's, it's just fascinating the way that we have developed. But these groups, even though they might have branched off anciently, it doesn't mean that the present day descendants are ancient. So for example, with haplogroup J, um, they would have been, uh, I think they're more or less around the kind of the Fertile Crescent, Iran, Iraq, uh, the Middle East, that type of area. Um, but uh, they would have present day descendants. Um, and they kind of mix, like if you're in your family, you're seeing all these odd groups. Well, if, if, of course, the haplogroups are called by the letters, and then different sub branches of the haplogroups are known by the numbers, and now we've changed to the SNPs to identify the terminal branches. These are going to trickle down to the present day. 95% um, of the descendants would have become extinct over time. So we are the lucky 5% of the human race that actually survived to the present day. And a lot of these branches of the tree of mankind went extinct 10,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago. You know, so we are a very, very select group of people. So I, I mean, we'll, 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 um, I'm not sure if we'll talk about it later on, actually. Uh, but I, if, if, if you have further questions, then we can, we can come back to that. There's also an ungrouped section in the Gleason project because some people just don't have a match within the database at this point in time, either because they're a rare branch of the Gleasons and they're waiting for another person from that branch to join, or they are a surname or DNA switch, uh, whether it's uh, illegitimacy, adoption, something like that. We don't know at this point in time, but for now they remain ungrouped. But the take home message from Y-DNA is that it helps group people together into genetically similar groups. Those groups can help identify a person's origin, and they can even identify a person's ancestor. So I've had people join this group called Glisten, and the, the particular chap in, in question thought he was English, you know, and his line goes back to England. Uh, I sent, said uh, an email to him, said, oh, your results are back, and it shows that you are actually genetically linked to the Gleasons of North Tipperary. So he wrote back, said, I've 
changed my password to kiss me, I'm Irish. So, <laughs> that wasn't the password, but it was something very similar, very similar. And another chap called Plesson, who has a fantastic pedigree that goes back to colonial US, New England, 1600s, C-L-E-S-S-O-N, genetically identical to the Gleasons of North Tipperary. And he reckons that most of the Plessons in America are probably going back to an early North Tipperary Gleason that was an indentured servant in New England many, many generations ago. So it's amazing the things that you can find out with Y-DNA. Now, um, of course, my surname is Gleason, and my father was Gleason, 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 Gleason. So my Y-DNA is Gleason, but I wanted to research my Spearin line, and that's right in the middle of my family tree. So what I had to do was I had to go back to my great-great-great-grandfather and trace a direct male line down to a living third cousin uh, who happened to be a work colleague of my best friend who lives on the same road, and he introduced me to my third cousin who agreed to do the DNA test. And that's how I got my Spear and Y DNA. So you may have to go searching for a cousin that you don't know in order to get the Y DNA for the surname of interest that you're researching. But it's very doable. Uh, y DNA very useful for migratory pathways, as I said. Uh, also building this tree of mankind that we've talked about, and there are the, uh, uh, the letters defining each branch of the tree of mankind from genetic Adam downward. And more and more of these branches are being discovered all the time, uh, so that now we have over 5,000, probably over 10,000 branches of this tree of mankind, and we're going to do exactly the same thing with mitochondrial DNA and the tree of womankind. And look at the migration of women out of Africa. Did they all come with the men? Or were some of the men soldiers and the women followed afterwards? So it's very interesting, uh, but tangential to genealogy. Um, we're also bringing the tree of mankind down into the surname era. So remember, Y-DNA stretches back 250,000 years. The surname era is the last 1,000 years. But we are now, and this is an example from uh, the Gleasons of North Tipperary, I'm able to develop, to bring the tree of mankind down within the surname itself. And you can see that there are six branches of the Gleasons of North Tipperary, and uh, we are defining them by SNP markers in brown and also by STR markers in black. So, it's a busy slide, I don't expect you to read it, but it's just to illustrate the point that we are at the stage where we are bringing the tree of mankind down into your surname of interest. And you'll see which branches, how the, how the surname evolved over time, and maybe even where the branches went to. Maybe certain branches came to America and developed their own mutations, or went to Australia and developed their own mutations. But it also helps focus your documentary research because you really are interested in those people who are on the same branch as you are within the surname project. We're also using uh, these DNA markers, SNP markers, and STR markers to a lesser extent to identify localities where they are particularly found. The O'Briens in uh, Southwest Ireland, for example. Uh, Z253 is associated with these surnames, so we're finding that certain SNP markers are associated with certain surnames, and now we are linking those surnames to the ancient annals. So one of the ways that I've been engaging uh, the local Irish in Ireland uh, in, and encouraging them to do DNA testing is by saying it might help put you back, bring you back to your ancient annals and the ancient genealogies. Because sometimes getting Y-DNA out of an Irishman is like getting blood out of a stone. One of the Gleason chaps, um, a farmer down in Cork, he was very enthusiastic about the genealogy. and He said, oh, yeah, my American cousin has done it. And I'd be very interested in doing the DNA test. And uh, we said, well, it's only going to cost you $129. He said, oh, I wouldn't want to pay for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you have to engage and uh, encourage people to do DNA testing. And one of the, the ways that the local Irish are particularly interested is by talking about the ancient annals and how it can actually help you uh, connect your surname 
uh, to the ancient annals. So I've done that recently for the Farrells of Annerley, the Farrells of Longford, and uh, they can now relatively confidently claim that the ancient genealogy that goes back to Fergal, who died with Brian Boru at the Battle of Clontarf, is their genealogy going back to 1014. You know, lo lots of missing generations, of course, but it actually does give you a sense of rootedness in a way that you would not otherwise achieve. So that's why DNA, and I spent a long time on it because it illustrates a lot of the issues around DNA testing. Um, mitochondrial DNA is uh, the least useful of the three tests, but it can be very, very useful for certain conditions, such as identifying kings in car parks. Um, and this, of course, is the story of Richard III, the hunchback king. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this our son of York, etc., etc. Much maligned by Shakespeare. He wasn't a psychopath. He didn't have a withered hand. That was added in. He did have a bit of a club foot, and he did have a kyphosis. But Philip Langley of the Richard III Society uh, has been campaigning for many years to clear his name. Um, Richard III died at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, and there's a plaque to him in Leicester Cathedral. And Philip uh, uh, was uh, doing some research with the society to try to find out where his body actually was, because it wasn't buried in Leicester Cathedral. There were stories of how it was thrown into the river after he was killed. And uh, there were other stories that he was buried in Greyfriars Abbey. But everybody had been looking in Blackfriars Abbey. And they only found this out uh, when they looked at an old map of Leicester, and Greyfriars Abbey is there, and that is superimposed on a modern map, and they discovered it was the car park of Leicester Social Services Department. So they approached the department and said, do you mind if we dig up your car park? We think Richard III might be underneath. <laughs> and they said, no. And they, uh, so R Philippa said, we'll give you 10,000 pounds. They said, thanks very much. Do you want sandwiches and tea with that? <laughs> and they dug up the car park. And on the first day, they found a skeleton. And the hairs on the back of their heads stood up when they discovered there was a uh, curvature of the spine. And what was initially thought of as a uh, ridiculous attempt by crazy people to find a king in a car park became more sober and more so somber as time went on because this skeleton was found in the nave of the church exactly where you'd expect royalty to be buried. There were battle wounds on the skull and on the pelvis and the mineral content of the bones was very, very high which you'd expect from a high fish diet which only royalty could afford. And they did DNA testing. And here is Michael Ibsen with Dr. Turi King from the University of Leicester swabbing his cheek. And when they did facial reconstruction, you could see that it had great similarities with some of the portraits of Richard III from 400 years ago. So it was the combination of the DNA and everything that led them to conclude that with 99.9994% probability, they had found the skeleton of Richard III. And here, uh, to illustrate the direct female line of descent of the mitochondria, we have Richard III's uh, extended family tree. Now, Richard, of course, got mitochondrial DNA from his mother, Cecily Neville, uh, but he would not have been able to pass it on to his children because men do not pass on mitochondrial DNA. Only women pass on mitochondrial DNA. So in order to match Richard's mitochondrial DNA, we had to go up a generation, down to his sister Anne of York, down to her daughter Anne, who had a daughter Catherine. Barbara, Margaret, Barbara, 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 Barbara. They had no imagination in this family. <laughs> and Charlotte, Charlotte, Muriel Joy, and then finally Michael Ibsen, the end of the line for that mitochondrial DNA. So they were lucky to catch Michael. They also had Wendy Duldig, and you can see her um, line of female descent there. But the combination of the DNA and all the other circumstantial evidence allowed them to use Bayesian probability statistics to say that they had found Richard III with 99.9994% probability, which is probably as best that they could get. So 
That's mitochondrial DNA, again, useful in very, very specific circumstances where you're looking at the female line of descent and seeing if one female line of descent from one suspect matches the female line of descent from another suspect in your family tree research. But, and again, I emphasize the Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA only look at one ancestral line. You have the paternal side of your family, which is, say, 32 great, 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 great grandparents. And you, you're only, the Y DNA only looks at one of them. On the maternal side, you have maybe 32 great, 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 great grandparents. The mitochondrial DNA only looks at one of them. It's the autosomal DNA that will look at all 64 of your great, 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 great grandparents. And this is illustrated in the case of Professor Henry Louis Gates, who does the fantastic Finding Your Roots program on the television. And he did his DNA test, and he, did his, he tested his Y DNA, and it came back as Nile of the Nine Hostages, which is an Irish DNA signature. So what is an African American doing with Irish Y DNA? This is probably a vestige of uh, slavery. And um, there is, there was, there's been sexual, uh, sexual abuse of black women by male, by white males, all throughout uh, the history of slavery, and that occurs in about 35 percent of African Americans today. There is, their Y DNA goes back to a European man uh, rather than to an African man. Um, of course, 65 percent it does go back to an African man, but this is one of the things we see as a vestige of slavery. By comparison, if you look at their, the uh, average Af African American, look at the amount of autosomal DNA, which of course is a mix of various nationalities, only 29 percent goes back to Europe. So there's a preponderance of European Y DNA among African American. Um, uh, so he did his uh, mitochondrial DNA. He says, maybe I'll, I'll have an African uh, woman on my mother's 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 line. But no, it goes back to a European. And about 10% of African Americans go back on their mother 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 line to a European woman. So uh, this brings us on to ethnic makeup. It, it, it illustrates that if you're just looking at your Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA, you're getting a very limited snapshot of your entire genetic signature. If you look at the autosomal DNA, it gives you your ethnic makeup. And this tells you in very, very broad brush strokes where your DNA has come from, what percentage, is, percentage of it is European, what percentage is African, what percentage is Asian, and so on. This particular lady, um, uh, she was uh, uh, one, of my, one of my ladies from Birmingham in uh, the UK. And she, her father was, ha, was Jamaican, and his father was uh, English, and his mother was African Jamaican. But this particular woman, who's the uh, granddaughter, if you like, of, of uh, this uh, English man and Jamaican, uh, uh, African Jamaican woman, uh, she looked completely white. She had blonde hair, and nobody would believe that she had any African ancestry at all. So used to, she used to carry in her purse a photograph of her father, who was a, quite light skinned. And she said, Look, you know, he's Jamaican, and there's the proof. But when she got her results back, now she carries her DNA results around with her in her purse. <laughs> and she says, No, I'm 25% African. Here's the proof. And you can see that the, uh, the African is here, and then she's got this European here, and these are the percentages. You get the same kind of thing on the other websites as well. This is living DNA. They're actually honing it so that it's on a regional level. So if you're doing research into Britain uh, especially, um, but they are going to do the same thing for Ireland, and these are the kind of categories they're hoping to have for Ireland. If you're doing research and you don't know anything except my ancestor came from Scotland, from Wales, from England, from Ireland, then this can really help narrow down which region within the area your ancestors may have come from. So living DNA is the only one that's currently offering this regional breakdown. They are refining these ethnic estimates all the time. You have to be uh, careful. Um, they, they change the algorithms and that changes the amount of DNA you got from a particular area. They change their reference samples, and that changes the amount of DNA you got from a, a, an area. Um, how many people have tested at Ancestry? Quite a few people. Um, did you all, ha, did anyone have major changes to their ethnic makeup recently when they changed? Yeah, okay. I, 
no more Scandinavia. So Scandinavian's gone completely. I was 20% British, 80% Irish. I'm now 100% Irish. I've lost all my British uh, ethnic makeup. Uh, so they are changing the algorithms and the reference samples all the time. Your ethnic makeup will change. So uh, when one of my uh, dad's cousins did the test, um, and I organized it for her, uh, the, the, whole fa well, she, the whole family were a little bit surprised when she came back with 3% uh, Middle Eastern, uh, and her children started referring to her as the Arab. So <laughs> So, you know, you do have to be very, very circumspect about these ethnic makeup estimates and just take them with a very, very large pinch of salt. They're just broad brush strokes. Um, Ancestry, I find, are the best because they have these kind of genetic communities. Here's one that shows uh, some southeast England and some uh, northeast or north, north, yeah, northern England there. Um, from an Irish point of view, there's a swathe across Southern Ireland there, and then some uh, the North Midlands here as well. So this is going to be refined over time as they uh, change their algorithms and refine their reference populations. But the real advantage of autosomal DNA is finding long-lost cousins. And I've tested my father, and that brings me back about six generations to my four times great-great-great-great-grandparents. Um, but I've also tested him, which brings me back an extra generation. And I've tested my mother's sister, which brings me back an extra generation on my mother's side of the family. So when it comes to autosomal DNA, always test the oldest members of the family, if at all possible. Question here. Very common question, yeah. And can It can. Now, if you're using hair, if you don't have the actual follicle, you won't be able to get right. very informative DNA. They might be able to get mitochondrial DNA from the hair follicle, which is the least useful. Right. And anyway, she's passed your, her mitochondrial DNA on to you, so right. you can okay. be her proxy, right. as far as mitochondrial DNA is concerned. Um, the best thing to do is postcards and letters because they will lick the stamp, put it on the envelope, and then the DNA will be sealed in there for the next 80 years until you give it to somebody like Living DNA because they do forensic testing as well as genealogical testing. All right, okay. Um, well, they recently had a great success with Anthea Ring, who was a foundling uh, found in the UK in a blackberry bush with her hands tied, so she was abandoned to die by the looks of things. And she was found 60 years ago and has been looking for her uh, family ever since. But they narrowed down her father to three brothers. Um, one of the brothers had sent postcards back home, or it was a letter actually, back home. They were able to go into the envelope and go into the back of the stamp from inside the envelope and they had to take four samples but the fourth sample actually solved which of the brothers was the father. I'm sure that's very expensive. It only costs about $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> These prices will come down over time. So. Um, the, you know, when you get your matches on Ancestry or any of these uh, major companies, you click on View All DNA Matches, and it brings up a list of cousins. And you can see it's first cousin. There's a way of viewing the match. You can contact these matches, etc., etc. Uh, some of them have family trees. Some of them do not, because it says no family tree. So if they, it says no family tree, they don't have a family tree, right? Wrong. Wrong. Yes. Absolutely. Because if you, um, I'm not sure I have it here, if you click on the I, it tells you how much centimorgans. So that's how you find centimorgans on Ancestry. Uh, and that's very, very important because we should be using the shared centimorgan project data to give us our best estimate of what the relationship is between you and this person, given that you share 155 centimorgans. Now, I know that the average for second cousin once removed is 123. The average for second cousin, which is just a step up, is 240. So this person is lying somewhere between second cousin once removed and second cousin. And that helps me place where they might fit in the family tree. What's the average for the third? 
The average for the third cousin is uh, 79, I think, 79, 80. Um, but the shared Santa Morgan project is the place to go for for that. Now, uh, I don't have it on this slide, but if you do click on, um, if you go to, let's see if I can go back, yeah, pedigrees and surnames. So when you click on the view match and it says no family tree on the previous page, if you go down to the end, it frequently has a drop down box that simply says select tree to preview. Well, why is it saying select tree to preview if there's no family tree? It's because they haven't linked their DNA to the family tree, and what they really should say is no linked family tree. But frequently there is a family tree there. Frequently the person who is the home person in the family tree is the same person that did the DNA test, but it's a leap of faith, sometimes it's not. I've worked with adoptees, and it turned out that the home person was the spouse of the person who had done the DNA test. So you do have to be careful about that. But it is a way of actually finding family trees um, when it appear appears that there aren't any family trees available. The DNA is great, but it's very limited if there's no family tree information associated with it. And uh, sorry, Mary, question. Absolutely, and, and even, and the great thing about ancestry is that the person of interest, the ancestor of interest, may appear in somebody else's tree that hasn't done a DNA test. And that's why I like ancestry the best. It actually gives you a huge amount of resources and you can find workarounds to a particular obstacle. Um, 23andMe does exactly the same thing, just a list of matches and you can contact them uh, by clicking on send a message. And Family Tree DNA, they have a little icon for the email address and it tells you more or less the same kind of information. Uh, with Family Tree DNA, you get whether or not there's an X match, but you can only find out how much the X match is by going through the chromosome browser and hovering over that particular segment of DNA. And frequently you find it's five centimorgans, which is probably a false positive and should be ignored at all costs. So beware of false positives as well. Uh, GEDmatch is a public access uh, website where you can upload your DNA from any of the companies and it allows cross-platform comparison. Uh, it also has a bevy of useful tools that can be used such as phasing, which I think is quite uh, popular, and also they have uh, some additional level two tools that can be quite useful. You may have noticed that recently they have updated their terms of service to notify you that law enforcement are using this database to identify unidentified murder victims like Buckskin Girl, to identify serial killers and serial rapists. There are somewhere between 80 and 100 police kits in the database. Um, it has created huge uh, discussions on ethics, privacy, data protection, and um, GEDmatch highlighted how you can privatize your kit so nobody can see it, how you can delete your kit or your, uh, your GEDcom file if you've, if you've uploaded one, if you want to, and a lot of people did when this f news first broke. There was, as you'd expect, a knee-jerk reaction because people were uncertain about what they should and shouldn't do, but since then, the number of people joining GEDmatch has brought it over a million. So there's a lot of people joining GEDmatch and the motivation seems to be, actually, I want to make the community a safer place and I don't mind if my DNA helps catch killers. And if it helps identify murder victims that have been unidentified for 37 years, yeah, sure, that's good. But it is going to create that um, discussion with our, in our community, and it's something that is never going to go away. Privacy and data protection are never going to be yesterday's topics. They're always going to be current, and they will always be an evolutionary experience. So the secrets of success with your autosomal DNA testing, and I'm going to talk more about this this afternoon, have an online tree. Put your tree online if you possibly can. Um, you're looking for common surnames, common locations, common individuals with each of your matches. Um, collaborate, initially one-to-one, -one, and then maybe in small groups of three or four people to see if you can break down the brick wall on a particular ancestral line. Always remember DNA is just a pointer. 
It tells you where to look, and you have to go back to the documentary records. You will need to verify your hypotheses generated by DNA by going back to documentary records. Uh, when I get a, a, an email now from somebody saying, oh, we're a match on uh, ancestry, and it's 155 centimorgans on chromosome number, and I go, time out, time out. Here is my pedigree. If you don't see a common surname there, or a common location there, or a common individual there, we're back to square one. We really don't know how we connect. So it's common surnames, common locations, common individuals, and I just generated this as a PDF from Ancestry that I can easily attach to an email and send it off to people. You can use a paper and a pencil and then, then take a photograph of that piece of paper and attach it to an email. It's just as effective. I always believe the new technology is great. The old technology is pretty good too. So a paper and a pen still works very well for me. And I doodle all the time beside the computer. So that's an introduction to DNA testing. There are limitations, of course. It's not a substitute for paper-based research. It's just an extra tool for your toolkit. The cost now is making it hugely affordable. And a lot of people are interested in finding their ethnic makeup. Many people will say that understanding the results is difficult, and it's very, very technical. And that's very, very true. And that's why um, you should take time to look at these YouTube videos from a variety of different places and just allow it to wash over you, because you will have to listen to this again and again and again, which is why I'm recording this session for you. Um, and gradually it will sink in, and gradually you'll get an understanding of what you need to get out of DNA. We've talked about privacy and data protection, always going to be hot topics. There are certain legal implications. Um, uh, sperm donor anonymity is now a thing of the past. So if you are a multi-billionaire who used to be one of those uh, sperm donors as a student, please do not do a DNA test. <laughs> Everybody will be wanting to know uh, your best friend. <laughs> so um, that's about it. And uh, if there's any questions, then I'd be very, very happy to take them. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Right. We have a question here at the back. Which test do people in Ireland get? Um, in Ireland, uh, Family Tree DNA was the first uh, company there, and a lot of people in Ireland have done the Family Tree DNA test because of that. Uh, Family Tree DNA have sponsored Genetic Genealogy Ireland in the uh, RDS in Dublin for the last six years, and uh, have been selling kits there. Uh, there are some very active autosomal DNA projects within Ireland. Uh, the main Gaeltacht project, uh, and um, Pat McBride from the main Gaeltacht project is here, they have been literally going out into fields to swab farmers. And um, they've had a great response. And they are working with local groups like the Karna Heritage Center and the Cashel Heritage Center, I think, as well. But all, so there's, that's a wonderful uh, example of an outreach project where the diaspora Irish are coming back to the local areas to collect DNA from, from local Irish. And the local Irish are getting a huge amount out of it because they're discovering they're related to their neighbors in a way they hadn't imagined before, <laughs> usually in a good way. Um, the uh, North of Ireland Family History Society covers nine counties in uh, Northern Ireland, and they're largely doing family tree DNA. Uh, Clare Roots, run by Paddy Waldron and Clare, mainly family tree DNA. And um, Martin Curley, actually, in East Galway, is doing some wonderful work with Jetmatch and using Jetmatch data from whatever company you choose to test with uh, to actually connect people both from the locality and the diaspora, and he had some great results recently with um, the descendants of 32 women who went out on a bride ship to Australia. Women from the workhouse that had no future would have been rounded up, given a chest with two pairs of shoes, four petticoats, two dresses, and sent out to Australia to be brides. And their descendants came back and met with their with the people that stayed at home. So, it, you know, some wonderful projects going on in Ireland. Ancestry now have as much, if not more, uh, people tested in Ireland as family tree DNA. 
23 uh, and Me never really had a big presence there. Uh, My Heritage, they're relatively late to the scene, so not a huge presence there. All of this is going to evolve and change over time. But I would say, again, if you're serious and you have an Ancestry account, test with Ancestry, uh, upload for free to, the, to all of the other ones apart from 23andMe, which doesn't accept them. There was a question at the back. Uh, because the different companies have different algorithms for uh, assessing how many centimorgans you share with somebody. So why does it appear different on Ancestry when you upload the same data up to Jetmatch is the question. Um, and it's just because of these different algorithms. Uh, they won't be out by a huge amount. So it doesn't make any big difference in the grand scheme of things. What Ancestry does is it has algorithms that remove uh, false matches and uh, it identifies false matches with 97% probability and doesn't include them in the amount of DNA you share. So if you compare, say, family tree DNA, which doesn't have that algorithm with the ancestry results of the same person, you'll find that the same person on family tree DNA has about 20% more DNA than the uh, amount that they have on ancestry. And it's because they have different algorithms and different way of comparing the data. Question here? It can do, can do. So the question is, if, if on DNA Painter, when you get overlapping segments of DNA, uh, does that mean something? Um, I'll be talking a bit about that this afternoon. Um, if the overlapping segments are on the same chromosome, so, so, so you have to distinguish between paternal and maternal. Um, so if you're able to do that, then it can point to the fact that that particular segment was inherited from the same common ancestor. And that can be a very, very useful way of um, uh, figuring out how your matches are related to you. So if you know that a particular segment of DNA came from great-great-great-great-grandfather George Fredericks, and somebody else shares that same segment of DNA, then they must be related to you via great-great-great-grandfather George Fredericks. So it is a useful way. Um, painting your entire uh, genome is difficult. Has anybody done 100% uh, uh, DNA painting? OK, nobody has done 100% DNA painting. Um, has anybody done 50% of their genome painted? No, no, OK. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about it this afternoon, because it is a very specialized technique. Um, part of the problem with relying on it too heavily is that you may be throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and I'll explain what I mean by that this afternoon. Now, there was a lady at the back, yes? Um, there's not a huge amount of, of value from a genealogical point of view in you taking the test. Uh, what? No, it's, it's not. And in actual fact, if you tested your parents uh, three years ago, their DNA results will be updated, 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 updated on an ongoing basis. So it's, it, DNA is the gift that keeps on giving. You know, it, they, first of all, they're improving the system that, that analyzes it all the time, and you take advantage of that, you get advantage of that as well, but also there's more people joining the databases, so you're constantly getting new matches. If you were going to buy a DNA test for anyone, I'd say buy a DNA test for a first cousin of your father or a first cousin of your mother, so you can narrow down which of their grandparents. You know, so always test the uh, uh, oldest generation and then start testing cousins, uh, first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, and it helps you narrow down and focus on a particular um, brick wall in your tree. So if you have a particular brick wall in your tree, test several descendants of that particular ancestor of yours, and that will help you triangulate, which I'll talk about this afternoon, on that particular ancestor and help you break down that brick wall. Uh, we have, let's take the lady in the green. What happens uh, in my family, 
It is combined, yes. So if you've got a uh, double connection, how many people have double connections in their family trees? Yes, okay. So I'd say that you know, the majority of people will find double connections in their family trees. Two brothers marrying two sisters, um, somebody being a, uh, you know, I'm my own third cousin once removed, that type of thing. Um, <laughs> And it just adds a layer of complexity. But if you do have that uh, double connection, um, the way to figure out how much DNA should be shared is you add the DNA of each connection separately. So with a first cousin, you're expecting this amount, but they're also third cousins to each other, so you'd expect this amount for third cousins. So first cousins is uh, 880, third cousins is 80. They should share about 960 centimorgans, you know, within a range. And there's a huge range around all of these estimates. Yeah. Question here from this lady. Is it ever possible to retrieve DNA from the folding of a post-relative who has died? It is possible to retrieve DNA from any uh, sample that you may have, but it will cost you an arm and a leg to actually get it analyzed. Because, of course, the police will, will do this type of testing um, on a sample of clothing or something found at a crime scene, and they will be able to extract DNA from even minute amounts of um, sample. So if you have a piece of clothing that an ancestor wore, uh, it would be possible to, to extract DNA from that at great cost, because you'd have to get a forensic laboratory to do it. The risk, of course, is contamination. Where has that sample of clothing been for the last 50 years? Has anyone else worn that sample of clothing? Has it been locked in a, you know, sealed in a plastic bag, or have people been breathing on it and their DNA has settled on it? My DNA is in the four corners of the room now, having been standing here for the last hour talking. So if a forensic team came, came in and, and swabbed this room, they would find that uh, my DNA is on the exit sign. You know, so it, your DNA goes everywhere. Um, so that's a problem with the contamination. For a non-forensic situation, where would a person start to find DNA? Assuming you have a, a pair of slippers, for example, you want only an There is. Uh, so the question is, if you had a pair of slippers, for example, that somebody had worn for most of their life, where would you start to try and get DNA out of that? Well, um, I would go to Living DNA because they do have a forensic arm called DNA Worldwide or DNA Legal, which has been around for decades. So that's where they started, and then they came into the commercial DNA testing. Um, make inquiries from them. They would give you a, an estimate. You know, so it would be something along the lines of the chances, the probability we will get DNA that is meaningful are 10%, 15%. Um, the cost will be 100,000 pounds, 100,000 dollars, 100, for example. Oh, it is very much an ouch situation. Um, you know, so you're because you're talking about very specialized tests. The best thing to do is, like I say, a stamp could be really, really useful. So if you have a um, if you have old letters that were sent to you by a particular person, you can assume that person licked the stamp, and you might be able to get DNA out of that. How much DNA you'd get is open to question. Whether you'd be able to compare it with other people in the database is open to question. But we've seen with the uh, amazing advances in ancient DNA, um, the uh, case of Buckskin Girl, Golden State Killer, and a lot of these ones that are beginning to come out, it is now possible to do what was impossible five or 10 years ago. So if you do have a family heirloom, whether it's a lock of hair or a pair of slippers, most important thing, stop contamination. Put it in a Ziploc bag and put it aside until the technology comes down and, well, first of all, increases in complexity, but comes down in price. So it makes it almost affordable for you to do that type of testing. So let's take a few more questions. Lady in green here, and then uh, these two ladies over here. Okay. <laughs> Parents don't want to t t test, they never will because of privacy. Is there anything we can do to actually uh, preserve some of their DNA after they've gone? Um, 
Privacy is, is uh, interesting. You don't have to give your full name. You don't have to give your true name. You can give uh, letters, you can give numbers, you can... Don't call yourself Clint Eastwood, because everybody will want to be your cousin. Um, you know, but call yourself Joe Smith. You know, something in innocuous. So you can disguise who you are. Give a false name if you want to. There's no thing to stop you from doing that. Uh, number two, you can actually privatize your results. You can turn on the privacy, turn off the privacy as you wish, which means that you do the test and declare that your results are private. When the results are back, you can briefly make them public, get the information you need, and then close them down as private. You can also destroy your DNA sample if you've got the information that you need from it. So there are ways of getting around privacy that you could discuss with your parents and say, like, you know, you know I'm going to get it when you've gone, but, you know, if you want to do it while you're still here, there are ways that we can protect you. You know, so that would be the first thing. And then um, in terms of a sample, um, people have got, you know, fingernail clippings, uh, hair, that type of thing. So, but if you're going to get a hair, like we said earlier, you do need to have the follicle. Um, but I don't like the idea of you going around pulling your parents' hair. Really. <laughs> so, um, you know, you have to be circum circumspect about these things. Okay, two more questions, and then we we'll go to lunch. So, lady at the very back, and then a uh, lady before in front of you. I understand, yes. Was I um, not really, but um, it, it, you, you, you got a partial truth in a way. Um, if you test with, with 23andMe and then transfer it to GEDmatch, GEDmatch will allow you to compare your 23andMe results to everybody in the, everybody in the GEDmatch database. But of course, not everybody from all of the companies has uploaded to GEDmatch. I reckon it's about 10%, somewhere between 5 and 10% of people who've tested with each of the companies have uploaded the results to Jetmatch. Because Jetmatch has a million people. The, currently, it's 18 million people in the database, so only 1 million out of 18 million has uploaded to Jetmatch. So in fact, it's closer to 5% than it is to 10%. So if you want to compare um, across platforms, Jetmatch is one way, but it's only allowing you to compare yourself to 5% of the total 18 million. The best way, like I say, test with Ancestry. You're accessing their 10 million strong database. Transfer to MyHeritage, 2 million. Uh, Family Tree DNA, 1.5 million. Jetmatch, 1 million, a proportion of which will be 23andMe. And Living DNA, which is several tens of thousands. But the only way that um, anybody can compare themselves to the 23andMe database is really to test with 23andMe, because only about 5 or 10% of the 23andMe database will be on Jetmatch. But those will be the 5 to 10% that are really interested in genealogy, and those are maybe half of the people that would have responded to you anyway, so you're getting a fairly good deal. Yeah. Any last question, and then let's break for lunch. Sure. If you go to the ISOG wiki, there's a lot of information there about uh, the haplogroups and where they are distributed. There's also a very, very good European website called Upedia. So it's like Wikipedia, but it's called Upedia, E-U-pedia. And uh, if you just do a Google search for Upedia, haplogroup, and then whatever haplogroup letter you have uh, in mind, whether it's R, E, O, that type of thing. And it brings up some very, very useful um, images and diagrams as well. And that's a great place to get some further information. It's a very, very scholarly website and a great resource. Great. Well, um, I'll stay here and take pr private questions, but I'm just conscious of time and dinner and rumbling stomachs. I can hear the rumbling stomachs from here, actually. <laughs> so thank you very, very much, and see you this afternoon. Ciao, ciao. Thank you for your answer. I'm very happy oh, my pleasure. to share it. If you would just give me the name of the company that I would deal with if I were one, I'd be back trying to find out how good sure. it's about. Um, let me just turn off the recording the so they don't.